this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss, and today we have a few things happening. First off, my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss, he's got some thoughts that he wants to share with you. So he keeps this journal where he writes his experiences that, that he has and things that God shared with him throughout his life. He's been doing this for as long as I can remember, and if you ever visit his house, you can see stacks upon stacks of these journals. And uh, in many ways, they're things that he wants to pass on to his you know, children and our children. It's things that God has shared with him and it, it's meaningful. Well, the thoughts that he's presenting today come from that journal. And I think that you'll get a lot out of it. After that, we've got a treat for you. We had the special guest here in our studio a few months ago and he was sharing with the Crosstalk ministry staff and it was something that we found very encouraging. And in fact, we thought that you might find some encouragement as well. And so we wanted to share it with you. And that's exactly what we're going to do right after the, the portion from the journal that my dad's going to be sharing. So this program holds a lot of good stuff. So let's get right into it. So I've had questions about the complaining of the children of Israel. I've had questions. Why didn't the children of Israel just fire up the barbecue? Why did the children of Israel complain to Moses and blame Moses and Aaron that they were going to starve to death in the wilderness? Why were they so upset that in Egypt they had lamb stew and pots of meat? Why didn't they just, I don't know, enjoy what they had? They had herds of cows and flocks of sheep, what was going on? And I find it to be perplexing. But God did what God does. And he said, all you need will be provided by God every morning, six days a week. And God explained what I like to call the twofold law of manna. There are two laws that God gave us about manna to explain for the children of Israel. He said, every morning, six days a week, I'm going to give you what you need. Just one, go out and gather all that you need for your family. Quote, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. Those who gathered little had no lack. Each home had just enough. And the man of rule number two, the only catch was that Moses informed them, quote, don't leave it overnight, unquote. They had no reason or need to disobey God in this regard. They literally had all they needed available to them every morning. They had full provision, but only partial trust. And in some ways, we have full provision, but only partial trust. They tried storing extra beyond their need, and it became a stinking, rotten mess full of maggots. Now, that could be a sermon about the foolishness of hoarding or the futility of trying to provide for your own security in treasures that decay at the expense of true abundance and blessed provision for those who trust God and obey Him. But... I just, I want to re refer back to rule number one. Gather all you need six days a week. And we'll call that, uh, there's a rule 1B, or maybe you want to call it rule number three. I don't know. But if you refer back to that rule number one, gather all you need six days a week, chill on the seventh day. I mean, how tough was that? Why, why we act like that was some kind of a punishment. 
But it wasn't. It was just, don't gather on the seventh day. You're going to have what you need, rest. The Sabbath of God represented to the children of Israel in the provision of God in their manna was profound. Remember, the people complained about starving, but apparently wouldn't butcher a cow or a lamb for dinner. Maybe they were mad because they had no bread to make a hamburger or a roast beef sandwich. God covered the land in quails. He gave them meat and he gave them manna. Presumably, they figured out their own recipes for using manna in place of the grains they couldn't grow as nomads. But God did more than provide food. He also wanted them to have rest. The Egyptian taskmasters, who for some reason seemed more desirable than God to those folks who were in the wilderness complaining about missing the good old days, the taskmasters did not care. He didn't care about their slaves. He didn't care if they needed rest. They wanted output and the steady production expected of slaves, but God wanted their well-being and their trust, and God wants our well-being and our trust. So, I'm pointing this out because before the Ten Commandments, they had essentially only one commandment. Quote, The Lord has appointed tomorrow as a day of seriousness and rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord, when we must refrain from doing our daily tasks. So, cook as much of the manna as you want to today and keep what is left overnight. God wanted us to have rest. He didn't want us to do without. He didn't want us to have a lack of what we needed. And he made a way so that we didn't have to worry about it. And neither did we have to work for it on the day of rest. But as we know, they couldn't keep one simple law, so God gave them nine more. They had ten. And this all began with complaints. My questions and my complaints are what I seem to not be able to escape my own questions and my own complaints. So I ask again, what's your brand? To whom do you belong? I still don't exactly understand what was the appeal of Egypt. I mean, starve to death, really? I don't think so. God had already provided herds of steaks, chops, and burgers. So what was really going on? I'm not altogether sure. And uh, the note that I made to myself was I wasn't exactly sure why I was sitting all alone in the middle of the night in a closed West Edmonton Mall with a light flashing because of a bad ballast. And I was still there at 4.30 in the morning, rereading the Exodus account, examining my own lack and my own level of trust. Well, it usually stems from some dissatisfaction when we're confused like that. God doesn't want us to be confused. He wants us to have the provision He has made for us, and He wants to have our trust to be in Him. So, I'm making the commitment to trust Him 
and to rejoice in what he has provided. And I would encourage you to do the same because God is good. He does all things well. He loves you and his will for you is good because he loves you and he does all things well. Till next time, Shalom. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. As some of you may know, here at Crosstalk, we have a ministry called Today with God. This ministry takes the Bible in video format, theatrical released video productions of the Bible. It's word for word. And it takes those video productions and translates them into as many languages as possible. And then we distribute it around the world. We wanna make sure that we're providing tools and resources for the kingdom of God to be expanded and we think the Bible is uh, pretty capable of helping that be accomplished. Well, we've been doing this for a while, but recently we've been targeting India. We've made some major progress on this, but we still have a lot to, uh, lot to accomplish. Someone who's been helping us though along the way is a man by the name of John Cathcart. He uh, was formerly serving as the president of World Missionary Evangelism, uh, he was there for several years and has a lot of experience doing ministry in India as a result. Well, John's been a friend of Crosstalk for a very long time and has been helping us with our Today with God efforts in India. A few months ago, we have invited him up here to the studio to meet with our team and we wanted to let him know of the progress that we've made and uh, just everything that had been happening and give him a chance to encourage the team about how meaningful th these efforts were going to be in India. So we set up a few cameras because we figured that, well, there was a chance that he was gonna be giving something to us that would be beneficial for you as well, and we were right. So what you're about to see is a simple conversation being had between John Cathcart and my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. My dad asked John a, a list of questions, and we, we're gonna show you John's answers to the question uh, the questions that dad asked. The first question is why is Today with God a good ministry for India? Let me let you jump right into his response. Well, of course I can't remember all of these questions. So you're gonna have to feed them back to me one at a time. But the first one, it's Townsend was the man who started Wycliffe Bible Translators. Uncle Cam. Pardon? Uncle Cam. Cameron and yeah, Cameron Townsend. Yeah. And he was evangelizing in South America someplace and speaking through a translator. And the translator said, if your God's so smart, how come he doesn't speak our language? And I think some of the biggest successes you have come out of some of the failures you have. Because you never remember your successes. I mean, they're nice. But I learn more from mistakes I've made than I ever learned from what I did right. So Townsend got, oh, he was down in the dumps. But he came back to the United States, and that was the beginning of Wycliffe Bible Translators. One thing that you become aware of and we have worked in so many different developing nations. We used to say third world nations, that's not politically correct anymore. Uh, in so many developing nations is that the thought structure and the grammatical structure of the language is so radically different. And 
as you listen to the translators, I always got entertained in India when I was speaking. And I'd have one translator on one side and one translator on the other side. And this one translated for me and this one, his translation took about three times longer. Never quite figured that out. And then in Africa, you begin to realize that they structure their sentences differently, very differently. And so you need someone that speaks their language or some medium that speaks to them in their language, such as you are doing, if you're going to reach them. If you paid attention, I think you can probably tell that Today with God has some major potential in India. If you'd like to learn more about the Today with God project or even contribute to its success, you can visit crosstalk.org and there's certainly an opportunity there. Now let's get back to the conversation between my dad and John Cathcart. As a follow-up to his first question, my dad asked John to share some of his uh, treasures, some of the treasures that he's gained throughout his life. I think you'll find some value here. Goodness me. Well, I have a long memory. You know, you and I first met, I went into a restaurant. It was an Owens. They no longer exist because the son said once his father died, he was going to get rid of every one of those restaurants. And he was as good as his word. But I went to the restaurant and I, I saw this gentleman sitting there at a table with his Bible and all these notes spread out all over the place. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in Bible versions. And so I walked up to this gentleman and I said, uh, what version are you using? And he told me, and that's how you and I met. So that's exactly where I met. The Word of God is powerful. It's quicker than any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of body and spirits and bones and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I once asked Dr. Isaac Komenapali in India uh, what he credited a sudden increase. Uh, I know the word conversion is not a happy word in India anymore, but the sudden increase of believers, let me put it that way. And he said, John, he said, a lot of seed has been sown. A lot of seed has been sown. I know of men who heard, uh, uh, oh goodness me, I'm trying to think of the name of the founder of WME. John Douglas. Thank you. Uh, heard John Douglas and they went home, you know, they went back to their homes and thought about it. And it was years later that they made a commitment to the Lord. So an immense amount of the Word of God has been sown in South India, in the south of India. To me, and I apologize to the, the Indian lady here, but uh, to me, the north and the south of India are very different countries. And I think Hyderabad is right on the dividing line. That's the uh, big media center and a big high tech center. And there are, as an ambassador from India said, there are two different Indias. There's a high tech India and there's a very rural India. But a lot of seed has been sown, in, particularly in the south of India, but the north of India has been a very neglected area. Now you might say to me, well, how did you get to get involved with the North of India? Well, first of all, WME was in 22 different states uh, in India from uh, the very south way up into the, into the north. So they were there, but uh, I was on the radio on one occasion and, uh, you know, you never know who's listening. So there was this multi-millionaire 
he, kind of a strange guy. I better not say any more. But he was listening and uh, he called a friend of his who was an Australian bishop. He was a canon at the time, the same as a Catholic Monsignor. And he said, have you heard this guy? And uh, the Australian said, no. He said, well, where do you think he's from? And the Australian said, some part of Texas, because no one ever recognizes my accent anymore as being Australian or being anything in that, for that particular matter. So we met, and through him, I met a bishop, no, an archbishop in the Anglican Church, not the Episcopal Church. Big difference. Uh, I better not say any more about Episcopalians, but he's in the Anglican Church. And uh, I was very impressed. Now, I may be saying too much. Um, I'm trying to be cautious, but I was very impressed with these Anglicans because they seem to be living a really God-centered life. Uh, so at any rate, um, I felt, almost caused my wife to have a nervous breakdown. I felt to become, uh, I was given the opportunity to become an Anglican priest. <clears throat> and of course, everyone at WME thought I'd lost my mind. My wife was horrified. My son just, Rick just could not believe it. But I came, became an Anglican priest. Now you've got to do what God shows you. See, here's the tough part, is hearing the Lord and knowing that it is the Lord and not doing what the mob expects you to do. I'm going to interrupt here for a second. John goes on to talk about how him listening to God and becoming an Anglican priest, even though it wasn't at all the kind of thing John would do, and even though it would require him to jump denominational lines, he did it anyway, and as a result, he made some incredibly valuable connections in India. Those were connections God wanted him to, to have for world missionary evangelism and consequently for Today with God. You see, had John not listened to God and not done the things his family uh, thought was crazy, he wouldn't have made those connections that resulted in a vast amount of ministry happening in India. This goes to show how following where the Lord leads is incredibly important in your life. Even if God leads you somewhere strange. Okay, now that I, I've explained that, let's jump back into the conversation and hear one more of John's treasures. My father was a military man turned church man. And in his lifetime, he founded over 700 churches. Now, that's not him personally founding 700, but the people he raised up, the ministries he raised up under him, established some 700 churches. Books have been written about him. Articles have been written about him. Some of them very critical. I read one of your father's books and I found him to be prophetic. I mean, it Oh, an incredible Bible teacher, incredible. A lot of people say the best Bible teacher they ever heard. Uh, much of what I am, I owe to him. Uh, outstanding man. But I said to him, I said, what do you think was the secret to your success in Australia, Australasia? Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. He said, well, I was the right man in the right place at the right time. I was the right man in the right place at the right time. You can't engineer that. You cannot engineer that. Uh, you have to flow with the Holy Spirit. You know, I never seek a word from the Lord because the last word I got from the Lord took care of 21 years of my life, <laughs> all right? And they've always cost me a lot. But I remember one word I got, it was a lady that founded Flame, Flame Fellowship. And she was speaking in a hotel in Duncanville, as a matter of fact. And uh, 
I didn't want to have to meet her, but there was only one exit. So, and I had to go past her. So, you know, nothing to do, but I've got to, got to exit. So she looked at me and she said, the Lord would say unto you, I'll give you enough light for one step at a time. And that's the way I've had to go. I've, I've had to flow with the Lord. It's not planned. It's not programmed. It's not structured as I would have done in the engineering world uh, where we knew what we were doing. Uh, I've just had to, to flow with the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and I got another great word in Malaysia once. I was also in, uh, in Penang. I, I can't remember. I think it was part of a trip where I made travel around the world, literally from west to east, uh, seven major cities in eight days. It wasn't planned, it just worked out. But this man looked at me and he said, and I was much younger, decades younger then. And he said to me, the Lord wants to, me to say to you, and this is not because of your age, but the Lord wants to, me to say to you, or he wants to say to you, you must distinguish between what must be done, what can be done, and what can be done without. And that will work for anybody. I mean, we can all take that word. What must be done, what can be done, what can be done without. And you've, you've just got to follow the Lord. As you probably picked up on, John has spent his life following the Lord. It's led him to some crazy places and through some crazy times. But he listened to God and God did some amazing things through him. Every time I'm with John Cathcart, I'm amazed by the wisdom that he shares and I'm sitting on the edge of my seat because there's so much I get from hearing what God's done in his life and through his life. So I hope that you enjoyed that. That's going to be the end of this episode of Crosstalk. And if you want to learn more about the ministries of Crosstalk, or if you want to even watch more of our episodes, I encourage you to check out the website, crosstalk.org. Right, our website sort of acts like a central hub if uh, you want to find uh, access to any information about us or things that we do. You can also follow us or subscribe on uh, our, our YouTube channel and social media by searching the handle at Crosstalk TV. We post encouragement there often and you don't want to miss it. Lastly, if you'd like to contribute to this ministry, you can do so at crosstalk.org or you can call 1-800-688-3422 or of course you can give by mail by uh, mailing us at P.O. Box 2528 Cedar Hill, Texas 75106. Stay tuned for more episodes like this one in the future. we got a lot more coming your way. Until next time, shalom and God bless.